She's still, uh, she's still reading through the book here. I have to say, I stopped for a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's funny because you sent me that email, and I had a choice because, well, I was planning on like, sitting there watching TV, and then you sent me that email. I was like, well, I should read this book. And so then I, I didn't watch TV and I actually started reading it. So. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it's, it's My email be like, don't read it. <laughs> you ruined them. I know, but yeah, you ruined them. <laughs> <laughs> I guess because that's because yeah. that's kind of the same thing. It's kind of like the course that's coming up. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, the beginning, that first, that second chapter, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't started that yet. I'm not that far yet. Yeah. So funny, because I told him that he said he should email us for us. <laughs> so would you recommend that I uh, leave that till after the course? Or? I don't know. Maybe yeah. it depends um, on you what want, you are. I mean, I do whatever you feel like you come with it, and if. Just don't get discouraged. Yeah. If you get in there and you hear all these weird terms and they put it in weird ways that are so convoluted and yeah, strange. Yeah. Just have fun with it. Yeah. yeah. Can you sit so I can see, Angel? What's can you sit so I can see what you look like? Oh, oh I'm not the only one who has that idea. Secret mango. They're different from. Sesame Street. Sesame Street. <laughs> there was one other new person from um, wow. Speed Up, a guy that said he was to spend a half hour with the year. So I will close the door. Is this after seven? Yeah, it's after seven. No. Yeah. Hey, Amanda. Hi. How are you? What did you do? You say something, sir? Did you ask? Yeah. Good time. I saw something about Kirtan. Yeah, there's one coming up here. Uh, end of June 26th. Oh, Kismet. Mr. Kismet is our, he's, he's on loan. He's had an operation recently. No, he hasn't, has not. Where, well, he, uh, where he, he was living before, before they had to go out of town for a couple months. So he's here for a couple months. Um, but I guess there's been a lot of, they're not really sure whether he has allergies or whether there was a bunch of like stress oriented things that happened to him, like a new baby. Happened in the house, and so he's been licking himself like oh. to the point where he starts yeah. appealing the uh, appealing it, or the hair is yeah. coming off. Yeah. So we we're we're giving him these pills every day, uh, that and we're watching his hair. If it comes back, then we should stop giving him the medicine and stuff. So, but he seems to like the first. He's really only now like it's amazing that he was out here walking around. Yeah, the, the first time he was just all, all hidden in corners and. He couldn't even find it, but you know now he's he'll be the he's like the boss now. Climbing, yeah, now he's becoming the owner of us very rapidly. <laughs> so, does any, anyone have uh, opening prayers that need opening prayers? I'm recording the audio. Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? Let's not. Let's have a backup. Yeah, that's right. Right here. ACI 14, class 10, mm -hmm. John Buchanan, 2015. John Buchanan. John Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all these offerings. I'm so Wait, that was mango chutney. Mango chutney. You make mango chutney? Are you a. Are you a <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Yeah.
So those of you that are brand new to this situation, I guess, um, has anyone told you anything about opening prayers and what's going to what's really about to happen here? No. <laughs> um, so there's you'll see there's one that's in Tibetan Sasashi Puki. There's one. That's, we're just going to say that one one time, and which is you can think in your mind that we're um, we're going to sing it in a melody, and you don't have to worry. You can just read it if you if you want to. But the, what's important is just to imagine that um, you're offering something for the teachings, like something. They say that these teachings, if they have the potential to set us free from our mental afflictions, and if it's practiced, I guess, with the right motivation and properly. So there's no way of coming up with a dollar amount that could pay for that. So we offer a mandala of a sky full of flowers or whatever in your mind would amount to what you uncountable offering like that and then so we'll do that and in, the, in the next prayer we're going to uh, it's like going for refuge so you're saying okay I'm going to put my hopes in the teachings yes, I'm going to put my hopes in the teachings instead of putting my hopes in uh, what the world has offered me so far <laughs> so, you know, instead of putting my hopes in what my culture, my culture, or my world, or the world around me has offered and has been offering me for countless lifetimes, and so far I'm still suffering, so far I still have up and down, so far my moods are swinging, so far I'm uh, still feel this lack of contentment, let, let alone let alone the bliss of a holy being that is completely and totally satisfied and just in love with all beings and experiencing the bliss of that. Not only that, I'm not, not even content yet. <laughs> There's always something niggling on my mind. And so far, everything I've tried clearly hasn't worked yet. So then you're like, okay, fine then. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to go for refuge in something else. And because we're studying Buddhism in this room, we're saying we're going to go for refuge in the, the teachings of the Buddha uh, and the Dharma and the Sangha. So then the Dharma means like the words that were spoken, that's one meaning, we're going to go into all that part of the truth. And the Sangha, the whole community of people that are practicing it, and specifically who have had success. So you can think of the Sangha as, in one way, the people in this room and all the people that you know that are studying Buddhism, but you can also think of it as the people that have had great success at putting these practices into place. So like they're like the Sangha. Okay, yes, you know, may I be may I be like you one day and have these great realizations and just you know, drop my drop the suffering from my mind stream. So we're gonna sing that one three times. And you can make a bowl out of your palms if you like, or you can try and make this hand mandala, uh, which is fun to try. And that is, if somebody wants to, Oh, Sharon just does it himself. <laughs> I've never seen anyone do that before. That's good. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. So this this is um, like representative of this mandala. 
this uh, this big offering that you're offering for the for the teachings. Really? Okay. And breathe. Remember to breathe. <laughs> yeah, and then someone will say the first word and then everyone else joins in. So maybe we'll get Nishi to start it. Sashi Kuki Jukshimeto Chamri Rabling Shi Nende Genpadi Sangeshindu Nete Uwa Gidro Kunamba Shingla Chupa Janju Bardu Dakni Tapsuchi Daki Jinian Gipe Sunanki Drola Penchir Sange Drupa so we'll do a uh, little meditation. Can I have a closer one? So, first getting comfortable. And that, it's not going to be a long meditation, it's just a short meditation. Which can be done in a chair, on a couch, anywhere. So, Close your eyes, or you can have them half open too, whichever you like. Just take notice of how your body feels right now, which is really um, just bringing your attention to it. And if you notice areas of tension in your body, try and inhale a breath to that area. And as you exhale, visualize the tension just dropping on the exhale. And then begin to feel the parts of your body that are touching any surface. I'm just going to call that the earth, like your cushion or your feet on the floor. Your legs and bottom on the whatever cushion you're on. There's something about noticing the sensation of where your body is resting that can be grounding. And let's open up our mind by taking a deep inhale, visualizing the crown lifting towards the sky, pulled by the breath. And then 
as we exhale, the shoulders relax, the jaw relaxes, but the heart stays open. So there's a little lift in the heart. So you have a feeling of expansiveness inside from the waist up, especially this feeling of expansiveness, openness. And what is important is all this is um, in a relaxed state. Your body's relaxed. Begin to focus on the rise and fall of your belly as the breath naturally fills your belly and belly naturally releases the breath. Not making any attempt to control the breath now. Just noticing. If you feel any subtle tension begin to arise in the mind, maybe the some part of you wants to have the breath different, or you think there's something wrong with the breath, or that it should be different. Just notice that movement of mind and relax it. And just let it go. And just let your breath be as it is. Now we're going to tighten up the focus a little bit by changing our the area that we're looking at. So we're going to draw the mind now up to the tip of the nostrils. And now simply having awareness of the breath as it passes the tips of the nostrils. The idea being that you would park your mind there. If it helps, you can try and feel the sensation of the breath passing here. It's a very handy way, very great way to help pull the mind's focus into the present moment. Because the breath is in the present moment. The body is in the present moment. It's nice when the mind joins it. For those of you who haven't heard of the Perfect Ten meditation, this is a great way to help bring the focus. If you notice that your mind is jumping off the breath at the nostrils, you can count the breath, which will help give something extra for the mind to ponder, to contemplate, to think of. And so you would exhale, you're watching your exhale, and then at the pause between the exhale and the inhale, you would count the number one. It's a short little one. And then continue to be watchful of the breath at the nostrils for the full duration of the inhale. And for the full duration of the exhale. And then at the end of that exhale, another number, number two. And pop it in there. So your goal is one cycle of breath. Can you maintain focus for one cycle of breath? And then can it be two and then three? The point being, if you can actually stay on the breath all the way to 10, then you really never really need it to count. You're already focused enough. If you need it to count, probably what will ha happen is your mind will jump off at number four, and number two, and you'll remember, oh, I'm counting my breath, and you'll come back. A very, very healthy, important part of this meditation is that when you remember and you bring your mind back to counting, you rejoice, you celebrate, oh. I'm back to lucidity. I just trained my mind to return to its object. And this is something to be happy about. 
So just continue to watch the breath for a bit. Now think of the reason why you came here tonight. What brought you here? You could have been doing lots of other things, lots of other different things. Something brought you here. Think of what you would like to accomplish in this life. What's important to you in this life? What do you think will bring you to peace? And then extend that wish out. And just think that I pray that everyone gets their wish. I pray that everyone reaches whatever happy desire that they have. And see all people easily achieving their goals, effortlessly, easily, harmoniously achieving their goals. And rejoice in their happiness, rejoice in their accomplishment, thinking that that must be a reflection of your own practice. That must be a reflection of your own heart to see so many people succeeding. And then we'll pull our minds back into the room, just watching the breath of the nostrils for a few more rounds, just to pull back and present again in that way. And then gently, slowly open your eyes. Taking in your surroundings, but not leaping, just gently opening, taking it in. Seeing if you can remain at rest in whatever centered place that you may have managed to summon during the meditation. Any time of the day that you can sneak a perfect 10 in is great. It's a very relaxing for the body, very relaxing for the mind. You know, you could be in the middle of some 
a crazy day and feel overwhelmed and and suddenly, well, why don't I just, you know, sneak off for a second or just sit at my desk or whatever and just close my eyes for a minute and see if I can bring my mind to bear on, in the moment. Maybe I can pull my mind into the moment and start to relax and you can gain a different perspective usually and uh, because when our mind is pulled away in all these different directions that our, our mind can be pulled away during the day. Um, it's easy. It's just easy to forget. It's just easy to forget because these sort of outer things become so important to us that we forget that we're not even really present because we we sort of get used to this um, mode of operation where we're kind of distanced from ourselves in a way. We're just kind of going through and and then uh, you can start to recognize that and then pull yourself back in. And then you can be more present for, you know, with yourself, which will then allow you to be more present for other people. Which will then create like a rebound effect. If you can be more present with other people, it automatically makes you more present with yourself because you have to be there for that. <laughs> and then you can... You know, you, you help each other, you know, by being, if you're present with someone else, it's like you're pulling them into the presence of themselves. And then you pull yourself into the presence of yourself, and then it can be, uh, you know, it can magnify. That's why it can be, I don't know, sometimes frightening for people if you start to do that, and then you're, you're you know, people will start looking, looking around, because they can't deal with it. They can't deal with... Um, their own presence. It's hard to be with yourself if, you're not, if you don't like it. If you, if you haven't like become comfortable with yourself, then it's very difficult to like be with someone, you know, completely. That's where the Buddhas are always laughing, because they don't—they don't have that issue. <laughs> it's like holy beings; they don't have that thing where um, they're trying to um, show off a self, right? present a self, right? present uh, you know, present the myriad ideas that we're hoping to to look like. Right? And then, but somehow, somehow in there we know it's not really true. We know that it did, well, that can't, and then so we're like, because of, uh, we know it's, it's not really true, it really can't be true, and because of some strange guilt, shame thing, then we're like ashamed. Like ashamed that we didn't attain the impossible. Mm -hmm. Because you can't really be anything but what you are, right? You know, what is it? What, what could you be that you aren't right now? But we put a lot of store into like, th this is part of the whole um, can't be content because there's, there's this niggling thing like, well, you know, there's always you know, something something to become, something to do, something to accomplish. And um, that's a major component of reaching, you know, having realizations and reaching states in your, of your mind where those things fall away. Because you, sure, you're in the world operating, there are things that need your attention, but you're not, you're not you wouldn't be doing it to accomplish something in yourself. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be doing it to um, prop up something, right? You wouldn't be doing it as a pillar for your pride or something like that. Something like that. You'd just be, you'd just be there with the present. This is what needs my attention right now. And then you would be able to do it, and then just it's gone. It's gone. You let it go, and it's gone.
That's the trouble with the iPhone. <laughs> it so easily feeds our like need to like just just be doing something, right? You know, we can't just like, you know, I'm being you know tossing around generalities here. Not everyone's like this, but you know, you know, what's why is it so hard? After a while, and you're used to this iPhone. Why is it so hard to just like leave it in your pocket? While you're, you know, I don't know, in a lineup. Oh yeah, there's a whole world of things I could be doing on my iPhone right now in this lineup, amongst all these people that I'm, I'm ignoring. Like, what could be more? What could offer you? What could offer you more than? Connecting with a being that's sort of standing right next to you in line. Mm -hmm. Is your iPhone going to give you that? <laughs> it's crazy. It's madness. And I, I, I think this is what gets me about this whole thing about the iPhone and, and the, the texting is it's, it's obviously born of a need to connect. But why not with the person that's standing right next to you, right? Why is it that you see people walking down the street and they're all looking down at their phones? So they're all they're all talking to somebody. They're just they're just not the person next to them. You know, they're texting out these things and these little cute little things, and getting it back. You know. Um, so you know what's 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 up with that? Why do we want to connect? Okay, sure, that's easy. But then why is it hard for us to simply be present with somebody that's sort of right in front of us? Especially a stranger. God, I was at uh, I was at church the other day. It was it was after we did the worship singing and stuff. And there's always coffee and, and tea in the basement. You know, everybody gets together and and I was talking to an old friend of mine that uh, I knew for years ago that happens to be there once in a while now. And we're talking about whatever we're talking about. And there's this lady walking around. And, you know, and she looked, she looked kind of like she was lost. She was walking by herself, and it was among, amongst a crowd of people, but just walking very, um, with her arms kind of like this. And she's looking around, and she probably was, my guess is be she'd be in her maybe early 70s, maybe. And I couldn't tell whether she was with anybody or not. But she was looking at everybody, and just looking at everybody and standing. And I, I couldn't quite decide what to do in the moment. I couldn't quite decide um, how to help her. And I was just, I, I was, um, in my mind, I was thinking, what do I need to do for this person? But before I could do anything, the person I was talking to just went, went over and said, are you looking for some love? <laughs> and she didn't say anything. She just went. <laughs> <laughs> and he just went and just went, boom, and just wrapped his arms around her. And she just went, she just melted. And she just melted for a second. And he held her, right? And then he, uh, he released her and said, Ah, now I'm going with my day. And then he said to no one in particular, um, "We can't be totally exclusive." And then just kept, and then just kept on with whatever he was doing, right? You know, and like that was his default response, I guess. It took me longer to get there. He did like I, I was just kind of wondering, and I think he knew her too from before, but. I just kind of didn't know what to do for a second. But he knew what to do. He certainly didn't text her. <laughs> <laughs> he solved the problem instantly. And I've never seen her before. I've been going to that church for years now. And I've never ever seen her before. Very interesting. Um, so what are we doing? <laughs> right, ACI 14. We're uh, ACI 14, the last class of ACI 14. 
So those of you who are just, have, have you studied any Buddhism at all, um, ever? Awesome. Online, I did. Online? Uh -huh. yeah. Online. So yeah, sure, that, that counts. Mm -hmm. I mean, people get married online these days. Mm -hmm. Why not study Buddhism? <laughs> <laughs> You can marry a dolphin online. Why not get enlightened? Are you married to a dolphin, Sarah? This is the secret, Sarah. This is a secret that Sarah never tells anyone. It's finally out. Um, so, on, so online. That's great. So what, what just uh, how, like taking courses or? It, it was um, out in Minnesota. And when you were living in Minnesota, or this no, type of oh, no, I site was out of Minnesota? In Minnesota but, um, no, um, this um, temple was in Minnesota, and I forget his name. It, it was about two years ago now, and I wrote everything, all of the lessons I wrote myself alone for a couple of months, hmm. and just it just resonated with me. So something so it like grabbed, that. It really grabbed my spirit. Mm, nice. Mm -hmm. Moved my spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, is there is there something that maybe is there something in particular that you think, or is, is there one particular idea that really got you the the most? Do you think? No, or, I, no. Just no, in general. No, I think the whole thing. The whole. Me. The general. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. And how about you? Um. Just watched online the uh, Tao. Oh great! The karma talk. You got it on the top. Oh cool. So but YouTube probably. They don't speak English. I still no. have the patience to listen to them talk. The translator. Just the translation. Yeah. But yeah. some part I don't understand. Yeah. But I know it's, it has to be true, but I don't understand. Yeah. I agree with it. You know it has to be true because of the feeling that you have when you're listening to it? Well, well, I don't, I have no idea how to understand that, but I know it has to. Maybe at some point, yeah. I know enough to, to right. be able to understand how. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. I agree very much with the vegetarian. Yeah. Compassion. Com yeah, that's yeah. how I got started. Oh, yeah. Okay, so the compassion. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, we're right in the middle of the last class. We were kind of halfway through. Not only are we... Uh, not only are we... Uh, the last class of the course, we're also halfway through <laughs> the last class. So this is class 10 and we're halfway through class 9. And class 10 is actually extremely short. So no, don't worry, Sarah. <laughs> mm. um, so before we go on, I was just, there's a couple of very basic principles that are pretty much crucial to understanding the what's going to happen or what, what we're going to talk about today. Uh, one is emptiness and one is karma. Okay, and I think emptiness is probably, I think both of them are very misunderstood. By the very nature of what they are, I think it's they're, they, they're, they're misunderstood a lot. Um, and I, I can personally say that I've been studying karma and emptiness for years now, and I had no idea what it was when I started. I thought I, I thought I had an idea of what it was. I thought I knew what empty or not. I had an idea what emptiness. I thought it was, and it definitely wasn't that. Um, so don't worry if you know these things grow in time, right? As you pick it up from enough. They grow and grow. Um, so karma, what is karma? What is karma? So what do you think karma is? If you say, if someone said to you karma, what would be your idea of what karma is? Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, is that what comes around goes? Sure. What comes around comes around. Yeah, that's it. Well, what goes around comes around, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, so what goes around comes around, and that, like in an absolute sense, like nothing, nothing is outside of that. This is the, it's, it's kind of easy to get on that level. Okay, yeah, sure. What comes around goes around. Like what I, 
what I put into the rules, what I get out of the rules, or something like that. Um, but it gets a little more difficult when you're looking at, is it gets a little more difficult when someone says something to us that um, hurts our feelings and we then believe that it's that person's fault that our feelings were hurt. Then karma goes out the window. <laughs> then karma goes out the window. Um, again, I'm making generalities. Just saying, uh, because then it's like, well, what did I do? I didn't do anything to this person that would make this happen. Um, we're, it's easier, we're more accepting of karma when good things happen. Oh yeah, I deserve that. Right? I deserve that. So, the thing that makes karma difficult is the time gap between when we actually plant, I'll just talk in, the, I'll just talk in cause and effect, and I'll talk in seeds and results. So, Shakyamuni Buddha said that karma, a karmic result, can ripen in any one of three times. So what 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 are any one of the three times that karma can ripen? This life, life. next life, next life, any or any other life after that. So that means that you could do a good deed today. You could treat someone very kindly today and not actually get that result in this lifetime. You might not get that result for 10 more lifetimes. Which ex explains why it is that you, um, you know, you might do something for somebody that you think is nice and then they get mad at you. an example of that. Actually, Mariska told me about an example of that that happened at a yoga studio recently. So somebody uh, somebody was in a yoga studio and they had lost their pass, their yoga pass. And they had recently bought a yoga pass. And they showed up and um, couldn't produce the pass. And so the teacher was there so they said, well, let me try and find, let me, can they, they just switched systems, that's right, from the computers. So let me try and help you find your pass, so just could you give me some personal information or do you have a receipt or anything that, that, would, that would show me a number that I can then just go find it. So from the yoga teacher from their side was not looking at someone who was trying to like can I have a free class or anything like that. There's okay I'm going to try and help you find this pass so we don't have to worry about this anymore. The person uh, who couldn't find their pass, completely flipped out mm -hmm. and said, I bought the pass. Do you think I'm stealing? Do you think I'm trying to screw the, you know, this yoga studio over? And completely freaked out and wanted to talk to the manager and got so angry that is now like demanding two free yoga passes. Mm -hmm. And you know, from a Buddhist perspective, a Buddhist perspective, um, you'd say, you could you'd say, okay, wait a minute. She wants two free yoga passes because she was offended. Because she got offended. <laughs> because she perceived something that gave her offense. Nobody offended her. You see? Like, there isn't such thing as an irritating person until you're irritated. So this, that's all right. So, no, no. hi. No, bye. <laughs> she got a high end. Yeah, she's doing, oh goodness gracious, okay. 
So, uh, so this yoga teacher got yelled at. Yeah. For being nice. For being nice. Mm. Now, if the yoga teacher understood the, the laws of karma and the time gap, they'd be like, no problem. I understand. I understand that I'm being yelled at because I yelled at somebody. It might have been four lifetimes ago. It might have been in this lifetime. And then it's like they're, they're relieved. They, they get freedom and the cycle stops there because she doesn't blame the person. She blames the wheel of knives that we've been talking about. So, and then the cycle is stopped. If, if she thought, oh my God, you ungrateful wretch. I'm going to yell right back in your face and I'm going to show you who's who in this studio. Ga, 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 ga. And then the fight's on. The karma continues to roll. The karma continues to roll. So, now, we, uh, we didn't talk about what, why that makes sense. And that, that is that the other thing that the, the Buddha said is, um, and there's some Dharma heads in the room here that can actually say, tell me, what did the Buddha say about karma, the laws of karma? There's three of them. Or is there four of them? There's four of them. <laughs> Sarah, tell me. Uh, karma is certain. Yes. If you rise it, it will grow. It will come. You get the result. Yeah, yeah. the result comes. Uh, it grows. It will grow. It gets bigger. <laughs> um, if you plant a positive, it will give you a positive. And if you plant, if you don't plant anything, you have no karma. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that? That was a mishmash. Yeah. If you plant negative, then yeah. only negative can come from negative, yeah. and only yeah. positive. Yeah, yeah. That's what it is. so so you can't so you can't get a negative result mm -hmm. from planting a positive karma. If you could, then the world would be complete chaos, and you could get an apple tree out of a lemon seed. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, how can you get, uh, you know, how could we expect to slap someone in the face and expect a positive result from that? Mm -hmm. And how could we? Hi. Sorry, I was just wondering. That's subject to the perceiver or the observer's idea of what's positive. Oh, de negative. definitely. Absolutely is. Absolutely is. And that's where it gets, starts to get tricky. Because we don't know what is motivating people. And this is where you got to be careful, unless you're a Buddha. But anyways, let's just cover those four things, right? Karma is certain. In, in other words, if you plant a seed, a result must come. So anything that you do in the world, whether you, if you, whether you say, think, do with your body, will produce a result. Uh, if you don't plant a seed, you can't get a result. And karma grows over time. That's what they say, too. So that's how a small, a small good deed can grow into like a, a massive good deed later. Or, and a small bad deed can grow into a massive bad deed later. So... Um, the most confusing thing about the whole thing is the time gap that gets everybody. And I think this Ariana Garden has said it's, it's really unfortunate about the time gap because people would figure out how to behave very quickly if as soon as they stepped on a cockroach, one of the ribs popped. Then it would be easy to understand. Maybe you'd try it one more time to see if it was true, right? You know, as soon as you punch someone in the face, they, you know, you just got to punch them in the face back somehow, you know? or. As soon as you give somebody twenty dollars, you, you know, in, in your pockets, and it's twenty dollars, right? Which is insane because if that was true, reality couldn't even function. You could there could be no functioning reality if there was no time gap. How how could you even do anything? <laughs> right. So now, now the Buddha is saying that. Yeah, what comes around goes around. That is all inclusive in the sense that every single thing that we're perceiving in our world is a result. 
of countless acts of virtue, non-virtue, and neutral acts that we've done for countless lifetimes. Countless meaning, you know, too many to count. Countless meaning like they say, they say if you took every grain of sand that, that made a mountain and added them all up, that still wouldn't be enough to count the lifetimes that we've lived. And that, that your, the mind itself is beginningless. There is no start to your mind. So there, there can be no end to your mind. There's only like a start and a stop to this, these projections of whatever manifestation of body and consciousness that you're having at, during that lifetime, which is like the blink of an eye in Buddhist perspective. Right? So that's why they say, you know, reach total enlightenment in a single instant. That means one lifetime, a single instant to a, you know, is a, is a, like they, they talk in those kind of terms, which is a good Buddhist um, who's practicing uh, well is not thinking just of this life. They're thinking of like, okay, this body will fail me sometime. I will die and I will go, I will continue. And hopefully if I'm plant enough virtue, my next birth will be a good one that will help me reach my final goals. But that's, we can talk all night about these kinds of things, but it's not really, I just wanted to ground the teaching for tonight. Um, so, so karma, cause and result, the manifestation of reality for every single person is, if you buy the Buddhist idea, born of past deeds, but there's a very important component that makes that all function, which is the emptiness part. Without the emptiness part, there ain't no karma. And without, without karma, there ain't no emptiness. They go together hand in hand. And the emptiness part is the fact that things are empty of self-nature. Because if they were, and let's just do this quickly for the benefit of everyone. Um, we'll use this object. We're gonna use this object to explore the idea of emptiness, which is, a, I think, the most... If you get this idea, if you truly get this idea, um, your whole reality will shift. If you truly get this idea, then you can change the way that you perceive all of reality. And, uh, and here we go. So... I'm holding an object in my hand, so I will ask the question, what is this object? And it's not a trick question. It's a pen. So this object is a pen. Does everyone in this room uh, see this as a pen? Just, it's a pen, okay. Uh, if I put it, the, the cat was here recently. If I put it, on the floor and like and rolled it around what would the cat do with it bat it around right it would be a toy to the cat so so now now this is now this is two things it's a pen and, it, and it's a it's a toy for a cat um but how can it be two things if the if the cat sees a toy and I see a pen, then what the heck is this thing? Is this a toy or is this a pen? What about, um, what about someone, uh, a human, who's never seen a pen before, walks in and sees this object I'm holding? What are they gonna see? A stick, maybe, right? A stick, so now it's a stick now. It's a stick, it's a toy, and it's a pen. So what is it? Is it a stick or is it a toy or is it a pen? It's all of the above. So somehow this amazing object has the ability to be all these things. And you could just, it could be countless. Countless, as many you know, perceivers of this object as as many things as this thing is. And okay, sure. Um, So what does that mean? If, if that's true, 
if it can be a, a pen and a toy, where is the pen coming from? When you look at it, when you look at it, you, your, your mind just sees a pen and doesn't really think too much about it. Where is that coming from? Is it, is it the way that it appears? Is pen inside this object? Could it be inside this object? What if it was inside this object? What if, what if this object had the essence of pen? What if penness was inherent in this object and it was like glowing for all of creation to witness? See me, I for I am pen. What would that have to mean? What would the cat have to see? Pen. Pen. So why doesn't the cat see a pen? What is, why not? Because there's something that's not here. There's something that this object is empty of. See, this, this, is what's, um, this is what's tricky about the word emptiness. Because emptiness, when you add the ness to empty emptiness, the mind automatically jumps to a positive quality. An emptiness sounds like an essence, a fullness, some magical, some magical thing that's, that's making this all possible. It's inside the pen. It's emptiness. Mm -hmm. It's empty. It's empty. There's something that's not here. It's difficult for the mind to grasp that. How, does the, how are you going to perceive something that isn't there? You can only do it logically until you see it directly. So, what is this object empty of? Spirit. Pardon? Spirit. Spirit. Probably. <laughs> what else is it empty of? Empty of pen. It's empty of pen. There is no pen here. <laughs> <laughs> there is no pen inside this object because this object exists only as potential to be labeled as something. Because if you have no concept of pen, how could you see this as a pen? How could you? You know? Um, so, where is the pen? Your mind. The pen exists as a perception of a pen in your mind first, which then projects pen onto the object, and it appears like the pen is out there on its own. See, that's dependent origination. The pen appears to exist independent of your perception of it to be a pen. You see? The pen appears to exist independent of your perception of it as a pen in order to be a pen. It's like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just a pen here. I don't need you. <laughs> right? And so what happens when I put the pen down and we all leave the room and Kismet leaves the room and there is no one perceiving this object. Is the pen still there? Yeah? Sarah's saying yeah? Well, oh, you say, you're saying yeah, the pen, the is, still pen there. is still there. Yeah, the pen is still there. How? So you so then you're saying the pen is a pen by itself. Right. How is the I mean if no one's looking at the pen and calling it a pen, you know, is it a pen? If it if we left the room and this could somehow somehow still be going, everyone's gone, I'm a pen, come back. <laughs> See me. Then it wouldn't matter. We would go. We would, we would go away, and this pen would still be here, and it, th that would mean that it was a pen from its own side, and it and it and that would mean that it would, that it was existed as a pen independent of the perceiver's projection of a pen. Oh. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm very sorry. Please I know don't it's be sorry. it's heavy. Not, it's a heavy idea. It's, it's a heavy idea. No, and this they say that you have to watch look at this thing thousands of times before you get it. Oh, okay. It's yeah. it's but I'll tell you what it is. It's worthy of every moment that you try to figure it out because you know I'm waving this pen around and uh, it's easier to 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 think of this when we're talking about an inanimate object like a pen. It's harder when it's a person or your job or words on a page or the Dharma, right? Or the Dharma or the scripture. Wow, this is amazing scripture. No, it isn't. Arya Nagarjuna would say, that's not, that, Arya Nagarjuna would say, that scripture is not amazing. But then he would say, oh yeah, sure, it's amazing. But it's not amazing. It's not really amazing. It's not. It's only amazing if you perceive it as being amazing. Otherwise, it's just black lines put in shapes on a, on a white thing that happens to be able to show it. And you look at it. And if you've done enough good, if you've helped enough people in past lives, you go, whoa, your mind explodes. And you're like, different. <laughs> If you haven't, but if you haven't, if you've kind of been, if if whatever ripens in that moment, ha moment happens to be a, a bunch of kind of neutral karma, karma, then you're like, eh, that's kind of cool, yeah, <laughs> right. If if it, if what happens to be going off at that time, you see, this is the thing, right? This scripture could appear to you as something completely sublime and life changing one moment, and an hour later. The causes and conditions have changed. The karmic seeds are different, ripening differently. You see, look at the very same thing, you don't understand a word of it. Mm -hmm. And you think, well, this is all a bunch of gobbledygook. These Buddhists are a bunch of insane people. <laughs> and, you know, and if you look at the words and you get afflicted, and you've experienced that as a negative thing, that's because you haven't helped someone figure something out in the past. Someone came to you for help, you know, can you help me with this? And you're like, no, I don't have time for you, right? then the meaning is hidden from you. And so that's because of the two, because of the intimate marriage of karma and emptiness. They, can't, they go hand in hand. So that's the whole trip is, that's why we watch our morality. Because it's, see, this is the thing. If we watch our morality, okay, I promise, oh, holy teacher, now, I promise I'll be a good person now. I will behave correctly. I won't lie. I won't steal. I won't do sexual misconduct. I won't kill. You know, I won't do divisive talk. I won't do harsh words. I won't covet. I won't do all these things so I can be a, a right, proper Buddhist, a right, card-carrying, proper, scripture-holding Buddhist, and I'll walk around and I'll be this, right? Um... There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're obviously going to get some good results um, from being very kind and being moral in the world. But if you don't understand why, then all that then becomes is just some other persona that you're trying to be. Some persona that you then put all your hopes in. Okay, maybe my happiness is going to come from this other persona now. That I will try and create for myself. I'll, I will be this moral person. Versus understanding that, okay, if I do sexual misconduct, I'm going to get cheated on later. Or I won't be able to keep a partner. Or if I steal, if I, if I steal from someone, guaranteed later I will be stolen from. Or I'll experience lack. I'll, have, I'll feel no abundance. No matter how much money I have, I'll feel like I haven't got enough. You know? My bank account could reach $5,000. You know? And it's like, no, no, that's no, not enough. And you're like all nervous. Whereas someone else could have $10 in that account. And they're like, awesome, I got 10 bucks. This is great. I can make it for the rest of the week. It's perfect. You know, someone else has got you know, $40,000 in the bank. And they're like, ah. I can't let go below 40. If I go close, close below 40, I'd say, I can't, I can't go below 40. No, I cannot lend you that money. 
John, can you, can you, oh, John, can you lend me uh, $2,000? No, because I only have 41000 mm -hmm. Right? That's, and then you, that's, that train of thought makes a person feel that. So, um, that is karma and emptiness. So, because other people, like a beautiful person, like why is it that you can see someone having all these amazing, beautiful qualities and you, and you suddenly want to live with them for the rest of your life, and then someone else looks at them and says, I don't, I don't get it. You guys aren't really right for each other. I'm just not seeing it, right? It's because what else is the famous beauty is in the eye of the beholder? Perfect. What comes around goes around. That's karma. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's emptiness. Mm -hmm. But here's what most of us tend to do. Oh, yes, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but we also forget that ugly is too. If beauty is in the eye, so is ugly. You see something that's like, ah, and you're like, oh, it's, it's, that's coming from, that's, that's, you know, suddenly this ugly thing is the pen that is self-existently out there. They are ugly. They are bothering me. You know, in fact, I'll be much happier if I remove myself from their presence. Instead of, oh, you know, my non-virtue have created my perception of this whole thing and I'm much better off if I can sort of hang on for a second and purify the negative karma and maybe they'll change in front of my eyes maybe they'll suddenly become something <coughs> wonderful I mean how many times in your life has it been like your best friend suddenly you do something changes and then you're like enemies or something mm -hmm. and then or, or or an enemy that you thought was like your enemy suddenly becomes you marry them you know I mean there's just no it is the same, it is just, it's a constant shift in karmic perception. So that was like Buddha, Buddhist 101. Okay, that was like the basic kind of crucial elements. Everything revolves around that. Everything revolves around that. And so all we've been doing this whole class has been constantly reproving that to ourselves and thinking, okay, so this course is called, uh, it's, it's a low jong which means mind training, which means not mind training as in like you know, algebra, but mind training as in what? Kindness. Kindness, yeah. But what is, what's another definition of like mind training for low job? Meditation. Yes, bodhicitta, but specifically cultivating stillness. That too. Too. That too. <laughs> it's all within there. Right view. Cultivating the mind of enlightenment, or or cultivating the good heart, right? So mind training, and so in the Tibetan Buddhist mind is here. It's in your heart. The whole thing is coming from here, right? So how do we do that? So we've we just spent nine, ten, probably twelve classes by now, uh, talking about why it's important that we stop putting our own needs, you know, first, uh, over all others. And that it's our selfishness and our lack of compassion and our inability to think of someone other than ourselves that is the cause of, that is the root of all our trouble. It's been the cause of all our trouble from the beginning. And then it's, okay, we've talked about karma enough, we've proved it to ourselves enough times, can we believe that, John? And then we get we got we got all these verses how to be how to behave right how to like uh, when you see someone who's bothering you how you you see them as a precious jewel here's my an opportunity to practice here's an opportunity here's something that's gonna show me if uh, I'm be, I've been doing a good practice or not or you know those kinds of things but there's two main devils in this course two main Demons, two main problems that are like the cause, according to Lojong, the cause of all pain, all suffering. What are those two things? 
ignorant craving, you know, ignorant capitalism. Okay. Well, those two definitely are in there, but they're but they ignorant desire and ignorant aversion spring from one fountain. How could you right? What is the cause of ignorant desire and ignorant aversion? What makes that possible? Ignorance itself is what is ignorant. Ignorance itself. Yeah. So when the Buddhists say ignorance itself, what that means is the opposite of wisdom. And what ignorance itself is, is believing, like most of us believe our world exists, and that we believe the world is happening to us versus us happening to the world. So an ignorant way of looking at this pen would be thinking that this is a pen independent of my perception of it as a pen, thinking that everyone is seeing the same object because I see this object as a pen, thinking that, and, and that pen is inside this pen. That's, that's basic ignorance, according to Buddhism. Mm. It's not wrong, it's not bad. It's just a basic misunderstanding of reality. That's all it is. And that makes ignorant aversion and ignorant des desire possible because uh, if we believe that the qualities that we see are out there, then we'll do things to get them. We're even willing to hurt others to get them, not understanding that if there's anything that's going to be uh, positive in this situation, it's going to come from my karma, not from them. It just looks like that. Mm -hmm. So that's why we can get so confused in that way that we're willing to, um, you know, oh yeah, if I, if, if I can just have this, uh, you know, I don't know, if I can just have this CD, this music, if I can just have this CD, I'll, I'll be happy. And you're just craving of this happiness. Oh, I'm seeing yourself listen to this music, but I don't have no money. So you go into the store and maybe you'll shoplift the CD thinking that that's a way to get something positive. Not understanding that, okay, sure. Not understanding that if you get home, put this in some magical device that then spits out sound, it's pleasant. Um, misunderstanding that those two acts are entirely completely unrelated to each other. The positive result of listening to the music is from some other good things that we did in the past, and you will surely suffer a negative result from stealing from the store. And, you know, we can talk about this all day and all night, we'll blue in the face, but how to you, have to, you have to apply that to reality in order to make it function for you. This idea um, has the potential to function for you in a major way. In a major way. How do you change your whole reality? You change your karma. You can't, you can't just get out the paintbrush and then decide and then change your whole reality by trying to, uh, like a robo closet, you know, put, put, you know, I'll, I'll put this or I'll take this and I'll move it over here and I'll, I'll get this job and I'll get this wife or husband and I'll get these things. I'll have this much money in the bank. I'll line these, all these things up. And then I'll, I'll will reach my happiness. It doesn't, it's never worked for anyone. It never has. If there was, if there was a formula like that, that worked, don't you think that after like thousands and thousands of years of people trying that someone someone would have said, okay, I've got it. <laughs> Just do this. Because um, the misunderstanding that happiness could come from having a house, that the happiness could come from having a wife or having a husband or having children. Not that there's anything wrong with having all those things. Great, have a beautiful car. Have a nice... Um, trip to the Bahamas or whatever it is, but understand where it came from, and then you're good. So, that's how we can then go on into the rest of the class, of understanding that everything revolves around the understanding of, he says, things are happening from something else. So, like, this pen is happening from something else. It's not happening from the pen. 
This pain is happening from something else. It's happening from my karma. It's happening from my perception. It needs something else to be a pen. It needs my karma. So, whew. Mm -hmm. yeah, you ready now? <laughs> the, beauty, the beauty of this is you hear this enough times, then you can read any Buddhist scripture and it begins to make sense. Mm -hmm. You can hear the Dalai Lama talk yeah. and the translator will speak and you'll be, oh yeah, oh yeah. Because they say things uh, that can be confusing. Yeah. yeah. But not from its own side. Right? It's not confusing from its own side. Because if a person has a certain kind of karma, they will they would hear the Dalai Lama speak those syllables, not even know Tibetan, and go, whoa, and have some major thing happen in their mind. Some major thing, go, whoa. Right? And maybe that's happening for you. Maybe you don't understand the Dalai Lama speaking, but there's something going on that's that's with that whole thing that you, you sort of you know something, right? That's a karma. That's not coming from the Dharma. That's coming from your mind, right? Because there are people that stand outside the the, the place and have carry signs and chant, you know, false Dalai Lama, false. Dalai Lama. And they see him as a bad devil person, and it there's no contradiction because no one knows other than the, His Holiness Himself what he sees when he looks in the mirror. Okay. We're going to go on to the, some verses, and I'm just going to just go on a merry way here, and we'll just have to enjoy the ride. <laughs> Hopefully. Okay. We're in the middle of some verses, okay? Think now, everything we see is something that happens from something else. Understanding that everything comes from something else is to see that nothing exists by itself alone. Things come, things go, but nothing is what it seems. Everything is an illusion. The face in a mirror is no face itself. When you spin a burning stick and see a solid crimson circle, it's only as real as an image seen in a looking glass. So, Everything, so when they say, it's a typical uh, illustration of illusion, because like a child will look into a mirror and, it's, and they mistake the face for an actual face, mm -hmm. right? And that's no different than us looking at the pen and mistaking it for an actual pen. That's all they're saying. It's an illusion. This pen is illusory. But it's not illusory if you understand. It's only illusory if you're misperceiving how it's appearing. If you look at it and go, okay, this, this object I'm perceiving is a product of my karma, of my perception, then you're not fooled. It is not really an illusion in that way. Um, it's an illusion if you believe that the pen is coming from its own side, as pen, and it, it, which means kismet would see a pen. Um, and a torch spinning looks like one circle is also another Buddhist uh, metaphor for an illusion because it looks like it's one thing but really it's just it's a one torch alone if you're spinning so fast it looks like one big circle um, so yeah think now everything we see uh, is something that happens from something else Understanding that everything comes from something else is to see that nothing exists by itself alone. So is, is he saying that nothing exists? Yeah. No, he's definitely not saying that. He's just addressing the misperception. That's all he's doing. You know, your homework will say, um, what reason does he use to say all things are illusion? And you have to answer, everything comes from something else. That's his reason. Because everything comes from something else, it just doesn't appear that way. That's why it's an illusion, right? The definition of an illusion is something that appears one way, but in fact, it's another way, right? So that's why this pen is an illusion, because it appears to come from its own side, although it isn't. It's, and see, not only that, but also, does that mean that our tendency to see things as self-existent doesn't exist at all. 
We can't eat those. We'll get some kind of like allergy or something. I'll just put them up here. Now we'll see how good you are, cat. Um, right? So the, 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 the process, the mental process of not understanding emptiness, that's also empty. Right? It's a karma to not understand emptiness. If it was self-existent, you could never understand emptiness. You would always have not understood emptiness and never could ever not understand it. And never could understand emptiness because it would be self-existent. Okay. Think of filling a water pitcher with single drops of water. The pitcher isn't filled up when the first drop drops. Neither is it the last drop that fills it nor any of the other drops alone. Mm. It is when the whole is done. When things that come from others have come from the others, then the pitcher is filled. The pitcher of water is filled. And only then. It's just the same whenever we experience the results of our previous actions, whether it's pleasure or pain. It's not the first instant of the cause that brings us the result, nor is it the last one of the, of the rest. It's when the whole is done. When things that come from others have come from the others that we feel pain or pleasure. And so I beg you, be careful. Do those things that you should and give up those things that you shouldn't, if only in a movie. Very obscure verse, right? It's not the first drop that fills the pitcher, and it's not any of the in-between drops, nor is it the last drop that, pits, that, that fills the pitcher of water. The pitcher is filled when something else happens. What's that? What has to happen before the pitcher is, before the pitcher is full of water? Providing water for others. Right, which would mean then that what is, what is necessary for you, for, for the pitcher of water to be seen as a full pitcher of water, is it, does it require the being, causes and conditions right? to be in place? Yeah, and so what's the missing piece? If, it, if he's saying, well, wait a minute, okay, we, we've got a pitcher full of water here, but it wasn't, the, the, the pitcher full of water wasn't the first drop that filled it. It wasn't the last drop that filled it. It wasn't any of the other drops that filled it in the middle, but yet it's, it's, not, really a, uh, it's not really a full pitcher of water until something comes from others. What's that? The result, the karma. Right, and which means then what? The perception. The perception of it. That's the missing drop, the missing part. So they consider a part of the whole thing the perception. So that's why it's so hard when you start talking about parts. Is something one thing? Is it many things? Is it parts? Is it all its parts? When really the missing part that most people miss is the fact that your perception of it is also the most crucial part, right? Mm -hmm. Things are like, like the, we'll use this, this object again. Is, is this object its parts? Does it have parts? Yeah. Okay, so is it one thing? Many it's many things. How can it be many things? It's a pen. <laughs> it's one or the other. It's either many things or it's one thing. It's many things. See, here's where, uh, and the thing is, it's like, okay, when does it stop being a pen? Okay, no, let's say it's its parts. Okay, so I take this off. I take a part off. Uh -oh. I take a part off. Uh oh. Is it still a pen? It's not a pen anymore. It is a pen, according to Amanda. <laughs> Sarah is, is agreeing. It is a pen, just without a part, one of its parts. Well, then how can it be its parts? It's still a pen. I took a part away. It's still functioning. Oh, it's because it functions as a pen that makes it a pen. It's still a pen because it's in the perception of it. Right, so you're jumping ahead. Yeah. No, it's true. So. Okay, so then I put the part back. Like I, if I just keep taking the parts off, 
of this object, at what point does it stop being a pen? When it's not functioning anymore as a pen. So I mean, it couldn't be like a non-functioning pen. Still, pen is still there. Somehow, pen is somehow it's still a, some kind of pen, right? Okay. Is it one thing? It's many things. It can't be one thing. That's pretty easy. It's like, well, is it one? Well, it has all these parts. It can't be one thing. I mean, it can't, it can't be one. It's, so, okay. Is it? Is it its parts and its and its whole? Okay, is it not its parts and not its whole? <laughs> it's, in, it's, it's all designed to make it go. Yeah. Right? You know, one of them has to be true, right? And they say, okay, you know, that's crazy. It has to be, it has to be an object that exists as the sum of its parts. Okay, we can, we can, we can rest with that. Okay, it's the sum of its parts. But then they say, no, it's not. It's not even the sum of its parts. Because, you see, because what's missing? It's not, it doesn't appear as, an, as a pen. It doesn't appear as all these parts. You see, this is how they say that, 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 that we're doing it. Because you can't really see the whole pen right. at once. You can even, even from that distance, you can try and notice your mind fr flipping out as you try to just see one thing, one whole object. You can't. The mind actually, you'll notice it skips around. It's noticing the bottom, the top, the side, the side. And you can't even see the back of it or what's inside of it. But what is there is a mental image that is that we're constructing constantly in the mind, just like imputing on the object and, and calling it one thing, even though we can't even see it. We can't even see this thing that we're thinking that we're seeing, mm -hmm. you see. And um, so what they're saying is it's, n it's not even the sum of all its parts together until the mind perceives it as a pen. Then you can say, okay, I see it. I see the pen. It's the sum of all its parts that I am imputing pen onto. What's the proof of that? Why, you know, why can we say that this pen doesn't exist as a pen as the sum of its parts? Because if it did exist as the sum of its parts without the perceiver, then uh, you, could, you could bring it anywhere and put it in front of anyone, and they would immediately say, pen. There's a pen. Anywhere, anyone on the planet. Anyone has, you know, a whale. <laughs> would see pen, because it would be the sum of its parts, without needing to be perceived as a pen. Okay. And every object exists like that. Every person that you see, you know, they're not, they're not like an angry person until you label them as angry. Like maybe there's, there's shapes, right? There's like a, a round thing on top of like a big kind of rectangular thing with these long things that are waving around, these other two long things, and maybe this round thing in the middle that's moving and decibels are coming out, making loud noises. <laughs> that's like the sum of the parts. And you're like going, oh my God, angry person, angry at me. Or jerk. Jerk, right? Jerk, right? And they're not a jerk until you call them a jerk. Until so, there's until you if you don't have the capacity or the the karma to to see them like that, they can't be that. You would just see something else totally. You'd just see like some person who's uh, like they could be yelling at you, and you can be looking at them going, "What has happened? What has happened, you poor person? Do you need a hug?" Is like you just you don't have the you don't have the karma to be offended or even be bothered. You're just like, how can I? What can I do for you? What's what's gone wrong today? And and absolutely without any, you know. And they'd be like, well, you happened to me today. <laughs> you standing in front of me, in fact, is like totally pissing me off. It's you that pissing me off, and you're and you're the one standing there going. And because you're so 
steeped in Buddhist education, you've been studying so long, you just know the truth. Mm. You're like, <laughs> I know that your non-virtue is going off in your mind right now, and you're forced into seeing me as something extremely bothersome. Mm. And you hold the line, and you, just, you love the heck out of them, and you stand there, and you just take it. And maybe you'll teach them something. Maybe something will pop in their mind as you just stand there and love them back while they scream at you. Completely under the uh, influence of their karma. Unable to do anything else. Like, unable. You don't get to choose. They, don't, they didn't choose that. People are good people. They, they want to be happy. They don't, it's not like someone comes up to you and decides. Oh, there's Tanjit. I know what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to just yell at her right now because that's the best thing I'm, I'm going to do. Yeah, that's what I should do now. It's not, people don't do that. Something happens to them. Something wells up and then they're under. Blah. So, and it's the same in reverse, you see. And someone comes up to you and they say, oh, you know, you're the angel. Mm -hmm. You're so beautiful. You're the answer to all my prayers. Where have you been all my life? And you're like, yeah, that's right. But that's exactly true. Finally, someone saw me. Thank you for seeing me. Finally, right? When it's the same. It's the same. Because then you can hold the line and go, wow. You know, wow. I bow to, I bow to your virtuous heart. I bow to the virtue that sees me that way and understanding that in two minutes it could change. In two days it could change. In two weeks it could change. Suddenly, like, they stop saying that and they start going like, where's dinner? <laughs> right? Where's dinner? It, because they're, suddenly you become normal to them. And it's not your fault. It's their fault. So, how, so if you can navigate your way through this world like that, you're home free. Just one thing will lead to another, and you just become a Buddha. It, it, easier to, easy to say this. So you have to like just continuously revisit it over and over and over again. And every situation, you're like, okay, you know, did they make me feel good because of something that they did? Did they make me feel bad for something they did? Or did they make me feel good because of something I did before? Or did they make me feel bad for something I did before? And you can continuously prove it to yourself. You know? Anyway, so, so it's like when dependent origination is complete, then it's the sum of its parts. Because, because a part of the sum of its parts is the perception. So there's a part missing if you don't include the perception of the object. When you include the perception of the object, then it is the sum of its parts, because that is included. All right. Woo. There is no wheel of karma here at all. Nothing is anything. Nothing is this or that. It looks like the moon itself is floating in your teacup. The things we do and their consequences float by in the multitude of the things in the world around us. I beg you now, be careful. Do the things you should and give up the things you shouldn't, if only in a movie. You keep saying if only in a movie. Right? What does that mean? Even if you just think it in your mind when you're watching it. Yeah, it's also pointing out like... Um, Life is like a movie. It's illusory in the sense of it's like a movie, right? Although it totally, perfectly functions, you know? It's like, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it appears like a movie that you get a headache, but you certainly have a headache. Right? It's not like it's not, it doesn't exist. It's, it's existing. It's just not in the way that we think. You know? Like we think we bump our head, and, like, and that's the ultimate cause of the sore head. That... Bumping into the object might be how the karma came through, but if you didn't have the non-virtue to experience that kind of experience, you couldn't bump your head. Or you'd bump your head and you'd be like, ah, 
and you keep on going. It'd be like, we feel good. Be like, oh, great, another bump, man. It's awesome. And what else can I bump into? <laughs> you know, it's like that. It's like that because you can't definitively say anything is anything other than what your karma is 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 dictating. <laughs> <laughs> Poor man. It was an inside joke. Uh, Amanda's recently uh, experienced bumps on her bumps on her head. Not recently. No, no, not recently. But there was a Pre period of time where a period of time where it was like one after the other bumps. The other. Yeah. It's crazy. You know what they say? They say um, that um, if you experience like bumps to the head, they say the karmic cause of that is from disparaging your lama. Mm -hmm. In other lifetimes, and we all we've all done that, disparaging mm -hmm. your, disparaging your teachers, putting your teachers down, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, so that's cool to like uh, not, not listening to them or just disparaging your lama. You know, that is a really really deep subject. Mm -hmm. But if you uh, you know choose a lama, specifically specifically more like a tantric lama, depending on how you see them. But if you say you see a, a being as, wow, this person's extraordinary, they must be this holy being, and you ask them to be your teacher, and you, you, you uh, depart on your journey in this relationship, is helping, they help you, and um, you should help each other, in, in, depending on how you look at it. But um, you despair your lemma if you think that you can't reach enlightenment. Because your lama like knows you can, and the only reason why your lama would say yes to you, sure, I will take you on as a teacher, is because they believe that you're not going to be a big waste of their time, right? And they, they say, and they, they love you, they love you, and they're like, yeah, and they'll teach you whatever it is that you need to be happy. So, you know, it's hard not to disparage your lama because no one can. It's it's like. It's like no one can maintain that view until they're actually a Buddha or something. Because that's... But the, the beauty of it is the Lama, the teacher, is such a powerful object that all the other stuff that you do with your Lama far, far um, over and above exceeds like a million times those little things. Right? Because the karma that you do with the Lama is so powerful because they're such a high object. Yeah, I mean, I, it's great to think like that because I remember once I was helping, I was helping Sherry move one time, and uh, I was loading stuff into her. Uh, I was loading stuff into the back of her truck, and it was a really uh, a pipe hanging from the ceiling with a corner on it, and I was loading, and it just went like this, and I went bang! I just cranged myself like really, like I saw stars, right? And it's really wonderful to be able to go, oh, I disparaged my llama. <laughs> it's wonderful. Because you're like, because it's saying you have this different experience of the moment. Suddenly your mind goes to like lifetimes. Oh well, yeah, some of the lifetimes I had this high lemon and disparaged him. Like you can do that, or you can you can go stupid bloody pole. Who put that there? Who's the jerk that was the jerk that put that pole there? I'm gonna write the bloody building manager to give him a ream him out, right? You, you can do that, or you can go ah oh, disparage my lemma. It's very cool. There's no in-between? Well, <laughs> sure. For most people, maybe there would be an in-between. Right? But the bottom, the bottom line is, the bottom line is, you just go, okay, you know, I caused that. That's yeah, no one's fault yeah. but my own. My karma caused that. That's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. However you get there. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get there. So, okay. Mm. So... There is no wheel of karma here at all. There is no wheel of knives. Nothing is anything, nothing is this or that. Right? Is is the moon in your teacup? No, it just looks like it's in your teacup. Because the conditions are there. So it's like, it's just another example. Your whole world is a moon in a teacup. Looks like it's there, the way that it appears to be there, but it's not. Um, Right? You think the beautiful boy or the beautiful girl is out there 
and they're going to make you happy. They're like the real moon in your teacup. They're like, yeah, that moon really is in my teacup. You know, the, the beauty that's out there existing without you perceiving it as that. Um, neither the things that the mind perceives nor the mind itself have any real nature of their own. There is nothing you should practice. There is nothing you should give up. Strip everything of your perceptions. Leave your mind as it came from the beginning that never was. Don't confuse things to try to un don't confuse things by trying to understand them. Live in the place called as it is, and then you will become a high and holy being. Now, now there's a very confusing verse. Totally. Right? <laughs> now there that's perfect verse for confusing generation or generation of Buddhists. Right? Okay, yeah, great. Nothing. I don't need to do nothing now. This is great. I love that verse. Mm -hmm. I'm going to hang out on my doorstep and just chill now. Mm. Right? That's not what it means. There's nothing that you should practice. See, this is, you can always, you know, guaranteed there's always something about dependent origination in it. They're always pointing out. So what they're doing is over and over and over again, they're pointing out that there isn't anything that is self-existent, including... The Dharma. There's nothing, what that means is there's nothing you should practice that comes from its own side. In other words, there's no Dharma that exists in the universe that you didn't create. You created it. And that's why you can pick up uh, a book that is Buddhist, that is Dharma, and completely be confused by it. And then two weeks later, pick up the very same book and have the thing blow your mind. Because you create because your karma is creating your perception of those words. Mm. So, you know, there ain't no three jewels here other than the three jewels that you see with your karma. And if you if you're here and you're finding benefit, it's not self-existent. It's coming from your karma. That's all the same. Strip everything of your perceptions means try to understand that everything you experience is coming from your karma. Notice I'm just saying the same thing over and over again. It's just that, and, and I'm saying the same thing over and over again, but why does it need to be said over and over again? Because it's just the mind is like a rebound. It goes, wing, oh yeah, wing, oh yeah, because we're, the habit is so deep. It's so deep. We need to be told, that's why one of the qualities... One of the ten qualities of a lama is they just—they're stoked about saying the same thing over and over and over and over. Their love for the student is so great they don't mind saying the same thing over and over again, which is a good thing they don't mind that because it really is only one thing to say anyway. <laughs> there really is. You, you, anyone's ever figured that out? <laughs> it's like, I only ever say the same thing. <laughs> just maybe disguise it a bit. I don't know. It's just the same thing, and when you get that, you don't—you don't need me anymore. It's like, that's, that's the teacher's job, is to get the student in the position where they either surpass the teacher, or they just don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. Then you're like, then you're equal. The, you're equal with your llama. The, your llama brings you up to them. Because where is your llama coming from? It's coming from your mind. Mm -hmm. So they're training you to see yourself like that. And the potential is there for you to see yourself like that because you see them like that. That's what the Lama knows. It's like, okay, you see me as this holy being? That's in your mind. Guess what? I can train you to see yourself like that. Then you don't need me anymore. Which doesn't mean that your relationship ends. It just means it changes. It changes into a different kind of a union. A different kind of a, uh, a relationship. It's awesome. It's awesome. Because your Lama says, okay, work together until you become enlightened. And when you when you're both enlightened, you're like, okay, let's now let's now let's go but now let's both of us go and help everybody, right? Like that, yeah. Because one thing you know, if the lama you know withhold wants you to need them, then it's not the lama that you want. You, you don't want the lama that's going to show you how to not to need them, so that you can carry on their mission as well. You know, like your your lama is trying to create creating like mini me's. <laughs> He's like, let's let's get you know, let's get more of us out there. You know. Anyway, okay. 
Leave your mind as it came from the beginning that never was. This means learn to recognize the emptiness of your mind, which is pure and has been pure from the beginning. Right? So, even your very mind has, doesn't have self-nature in the sense of how you perceive your mind is also karma. And that, that pure potential has always been. There's a part of your existence, the part of your experience, which most people can't tap into until they've gone deep, deep, deep into the mind that has just always been. It's just always been, and will always be. Can't die, can't be born. And everything is like arising from that. Uh, and so there are two ways to think of it. Like, you can think of it like that, and you can also think of it like everything about you and your mind has always been void of self-existence. You know, there ain't no part of you that exists like it appears the pen exists out there, which is what makes, which, which is what makes it possible for your perception of yourself to change from normal suffering person to holy being. Because if you were self-existently normal suffering person, there's no way that you could become anything other than that. You would always be that, and you would have always been that. All right. Um, live in the place called as it is means the real nature of it is. Uh, means live in the place that understands nature, uh, understands as it is, meaning understands that things exist uh, relative to karma and emptiness. That's what as it is means. You know, as it is means, yeah, well, that's not karma. That's not karma producing. So, you know, he he finally ends this long low jump in a heavy emptiness teaching, right? He slams it home by a heavy emptiness teaching, which is supposed to then entice us to act accordingly. Be kind because, right? Oh, I need, I must be kind uh, so that my whole world will change into a paradise. Not because I, I want to be a kind person. <coughs> Although, that's also nice. That's like a, it's almost like a side effect. The benefit of feeling kind. Um, and that's it for that class. And now we wrap up. We're going to go right into the next class, which really is uh, just a little blessing. It was just he reads out. There's these two little lojongs that we just get to read out and listen to, and then we're done. Um, here's the first lojong. It's called, Herein are contained the instructions for developing the good heart, which were passed, de sorry, passed down through the master translator of Sumpa. That's what it's called. He's called Sumpa Latsawa. Remember what Latsawa means? Master translator. So here's how it starts out. Guru Namo, which means I bow down to my Holy Lama. It starts out like that. It happened that the accomplished saint named the master translator of Sumpa traveled to India. While there, he was able to study a great deal of the secret teachings. So you imagine he goes to India get, and he would have had to carry back then a huge bag of gold dust to make an offering for the teachings. And often what they would do is they would just like throw it into the wind, right? So they, especially the Tibetans that were coming to India, they wanted to uh, be sure that these people were serious. And it would have taken a long time to accumulate a big bag of gold dust. So they think, okay, this is what this, this is worth to me. I took all this time to gather this gold dust. Holy teacher, teach me. I'm like, oh, great. And just throw it into the wind. <laughs> as a teaching in itself right? um, you know, then you get to go <laughs> what have you just done <laughs> and that's the, probably the first teaching that Lama gives you right? Um, while he was there he was able to study a great deal of the secret teachings when it came time for him to return to Tibet he took the leftover gold, which whatever he had left in his thing, he had with him and set off first to the seat of the diamond, 
So the seat of the diamond is the place they say where the Lord Buddha got, got enlightened. I'm not going to go too much into this, but it is said that Vajrasana, right, the seat of the diamond, it is said that every Buddha that becomes, when you become enlightened, you will also get enlightened in a city called Vajrasana, and you will be sitting at the seat of the diamond. I mean, Vrasana, sorry. So that, what does that mean? That just means that every person that comes and becomes enlightened, you know, finally sits down in, in the final moments, they're, they're having a certain type of perception. They're having a certain type of perception just before it happens. And they're in this kind of place. So that's, it's not like, you know, you get a bus ticket to, you know, okay, you know, and you go to the Greyhound station, they go, yeah, guess what? I'm about to be enlightened. Where's the Vrasana tickets? It's not like that. It's like wherever you happen to be at that time becomes that place. Okay. Uh, so, so that he, he wants to go there, so he could make offerings at the site of the great enlightenment. People do that. They go to these sites and they just make offerings to the place. Okay. Which now is Bodh Gaya. Right? Um, one day, after reaching the seat of the diamond, he spent some time at the great temple, walking around it in prayer, and sometimes pausing for a rest. There was a woman there as well, in red. As he watched her walking around the temple, he noticed for a while that she would be stepping on the ground, and then for a stretch, she would be stepping in the air itself, and then on the ground once more. And then there was a lady in green, and she walked at the side of the lady in red, and she said but four things. I don't feel so well today. I have this urge to get going somewhere. It would be better if people didn't have to die. Death is such a frightening thing. This is the lady in green speaks to this. The lady in red turns to the lady in green and with a sideways glance at the master translator, she, you know, makes sure that she, she makes sure that the master translator is paying attention to what she's about to say. And she says, my dear, once you've learned to be satisfied with whatever comes to you, you will find happiness no matter what happens. Your problem is that you're never satisfied. My dear, once you've learned to leave your mind in one place, you can go wherever you want. Your problem is that you've never learned to leave your mind in one place. My dear, once your mind is sunk into the Dharma, even dying is an easy thing to do. Your problem is that you've never learned to leave your mind in one place. I mean, sorry, your problem is that you're Mind is never sunk into the Dharma. My dear, once you've realized that the mind is beyond all beginning, there is no death at all. Your problem is that you've never realized that the mind is beyond all beginning. And with these words, all the sadness that the master translator had ever felt in his heart melted away. All the Dharma that he'd ever heard suddenly took on meaning. And he would say that at that moment, he gained his greatest realizations of all. That's the lojong. That's the whole thing. And so we get to just listen and think about what just happened. And the... Uh, And then he gives, a lot of these lojongs, most of the lojongs, at the very end, they give the lineage to the lojong. Like, this was said by this, by this, by this. And he's saying, here is the lineage. <laughs> it was spoken first to the master translator, that's himself. It was spoken first to the master translator of Sumpa by the pair of holy angels, the diamond sow, Vajrayogini, and the lady of liberation. That was the lady in red, Vajrayogini, enlightened angel, and the lady in green, Tara, green Tara. So he's, so he had built up such a karmic force that he went, circled and circled, made offerings and make offerings, and then something popped in his mind, and then he just saw, witnessed this whole thing, and every word that those two beings appeared to say just blew his mind apart, and all the sadness left, and he became like this. Everything came together. All the years that he put into studies all came together in that in those four lines. See, that's another example of the emptiness of words and the emptiness of 
you know, like that, of the beings themselves. Okay, final one, and then we're done. This little blessing that we get. This is a lojong that Lord Atisha heard one day. On a very special day, Lord Atisha was training his mind in the wish for enlightenment while circling a holy place on foot. Off to the east then, up in the sky, in the direction of the seat of the diamond, again, the seat of the Buddha's enlightenment, he saw two women. Their bodies were something just beyond a human form, but something just short of the divine. And they were covered in precious jewels. The younger of the two made as if to ask a question of the older. What method would a person have to train themselves in if she, if she or he hoped to reach their enlightenment very quickly? And the older of the two replied, In the way of the secret word, and said to the other, No, no, sorry. And the older of the two replied, In the way of the secret word, and said to the other, A person who hopes to reach enlightenment most quickly, should practice the wish for enlightenment. That's it. And the commentary on that thing is simply this. Uh, these two women were the Lady of Liberation, who is Tara, and the Woman of Ferocity, who is uh, a wrathful form of Tara, or a ferocious form of Tara. So two forms of Tara. Uh, and you know, that's what he saw. And that's what he heard. And that's it. So uh, I thank you all for coming to ECF 14. It's been uh, uh, really amazing to teach it. Really, really amazing to teach it. And really amazing to, to say these words. You know, so thank you all for that blessing, for giving me the chance to say these words. And, uh, you, know, it, you know, I don't know if you figured it out or not yet, but this within this course everything is here you know everything is within this course if you practice these things uh, diligently the, you know nothing can stand in your way nothing can stand in your way it gives you the ability to plant the proper seeds to then be forced into seeing yourself right as a holy being, and that's there ain't no you, you, you there ain't no you as a holy being that isn't going to come from your karma. That's the only place it's going to come from. It's not just going to like arise from you know not doing anything and continuing to you know, worry more about ourselves than anyone else, and you know not 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 able to get over the me 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 me. Me, 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 self-cherishing in an unhealthy way. So, so thank you. <laughs> and we do uh, closing prayers. We don't prostrate, which because because uh, they say unfinished business. It's best to leave it open. Kismet? <laughs> 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 really, you want to hear this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Would you help me with the second one? Okay, well. Oh, all, you, all, you gotta do, all you gotta do is say, oh, there, oh, there she's back. Perfect. <laughs>
Awesome. And then we get a two week, I think two week break. Yeah, and then we're gonna start ACI thirteen. An amazing logic course. What's that? Yeah, we're going backwards. Thanks for coming. Oh yeah, please, please show. Is that what I'll have? I didn't have the answer.